Everybody has a destiny. For years, I felt like, believed that my destiny was to do comedy. I was blown away a few years ago when I did a life map. Now, life map is when you write down all of your memories, the good, bad, the ugly, from the earliest memories you have all the way up until now. And what you see when you look at those memories, you see that uh, there are different uh, messages, life messages that you gotta communicate, different things that you must do. So when I did mine, uh, one of my first school memories, I remember in first grade where you know, I was a quiet kid, pretty good, you know, had parents who didn't play acting up in school. So what I would do in first grade, I would sit beside the class clown and tell him what jokes to tell. And then in second grade, the only books that I checked out the library were um, airplane, paper airplane books, how to draw books, and joke books. And then when I got to third grade, I remember keeping a notebook of jokes that I wrote or did I made up. So I had an actual journal that I was keeping in third grade of jokes that I wrote. In fourth grade, that's when the boys pecking order really starts. You begin to distinguish, you know, who the cool cats, who the guys who could play ball. And uh, yeah, I wasn't one of those dudes. I wasn't a ball player. You know, I even wasn't the smartest dude. But I noticed that in the school cafeteria at lunchtime, when it came time for guys to start sparring, joking, that I began to hold my own and stand head and shoulders above the dudes who could dress, the dudes who had the girlfriends, and the dudes who could play ball. When I got to fifth grade, I went to a school, a uh, pretty diverse school, but there also some, some cats in my, my fifth grade class who were just rough. I mean, these dudes could fight, and I wanted to fight them. <laughs> so these dudes who were my friends, I mean, they were hardcore. They could fight and they could joke hard. And I knew if I wasn't gonna get in the fight that I needed to hold my own joking. And these dudes were very cutthroat with their jokes. Sometimes they would start trying to joke on me. And to their shock, your boy could hold his own with the rough heads. That's right, Jason Earls. I can't fight worth nothing in fifth grade. But I learned how to, you know, how to how to stand my own with jokes. So I guess you would say in fifth grade, I learned comedy with an edge. When I got to middle school, that's when I realized that I was very good at making people laugh. I was in the band, was pretty good, but I wasn't the best. I would get first chair for about a day because the dude first chair was, was absent. You know, I wasn't the smartest dude. I wasn't, again, the best athlete. But when it came to joking, when it came to being funny, I knew that I was one of the best. Then when I got to high school, not only did I stay funny, but I noticed that I got even funnier and even sharper. One day, I was watching TV and saw some comedians or some people who wanted to be comedians. They went to the improv to study to learn how to be a comedian. So I saw that and I was like, uh. I went to my dad and said, Dad, instead of going to college, I want to go to the improv to learn how to be a comedian. And my dad fell out and he started laughing like, oh boy, you crazy, you are funny. I was like, oh, I guess that's the end of that. And uh, so I went to school, went to college, got me a degree, and uh, even got better at telling jokes. So thanks, Dad. My wife is pregnant. Woo! Yeah, I found out on Facebook. She finally accepted my friend request. This makes baby number six. Woo! Yeah, I know, man. We got so many kids. They don't even play house anymore. They play daycare. Their names are Aaron, Alex, Alicia, Andrew, and Akeem. This is my first time making straight A's. You know, and having a lot of kids is fun. Stuff never gets old. Like my one-year-old, he was learning how to walk, and we were so excited, but we were scared at the same time because he couldn't walk straight. He walks sideways, he's like, okay, nah. 
<laughs> and I was nervous, so I would get in front of him, like, come here, man. He's like, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> And when he finally got it, still was scared because he looked like a baby giraffe. He like, ah! <laughs> I know a giraffe doesn't make that noise, but it's funny to me. Ah! <laughs> These are the most gorgeous children you will ever meet. Uh, man, they're, they're so wise. If little Debbie ever comes up missing, my kids will make great search and rescue team members because they are excellent with their sense of snacks. So I like to play tricks on them. I'll, you know, come in the living room and get a little snack bag and it's like this. And they come up looking like some meerkats. They're like... They also very embarrassing. We were at my daughter's kindergarten graduation and she got up for her speech and said, uh, when I grow up, I want to be on The Biggest Loser. <laughs> I have failed you as a father. My oldest, who's the scholar of the family, he's embarrassing too. We were at a family gathering, and they asked him, what do you want to be when you grow up? He said, well, my favorite countries are Korea and Ghana, so when I grow up, I'm going to, come, Mom, I'm going to create my own country, and I'm going to name it Gonorrhea. <laughs> and my uncle's right there. He said, <laughs> been there before. Your auntie took me. <laughs> so, man, you know, he met his favorite famous person. And he told him, he said, hey, I Googled you. A nine-year-old saying that he Googled somebody. I said, that's going to be in the next wave of love songs. I can imagine him or one of his friends writing a song about trying to find their wife. They're like, I've been Googling, Googling you all my life. I've been Googling, Googling. I've been Googling. I've been looking for you all over the internet. But I can't find you, baby, because there's no app for that. Mama said girls like it when you line up all of your ducks. <laughs> but tell me why I've done that and I'm still in Starbucks where I'm Googling. Woo! Uh, Googling where I'm Googling. Woo! Googling. Please add me as your friend in your Facebook. And I will tweet like a bird Cause I'm linked in your world Without you, baby My days are black like a berry And once I found you I'll scream yahoo I've been Googling Woo! I'm Googling I've been Googling uh. Googling, and I finally realized this whole doggone time you were in my space. As a preacher's kid, or even a kid whose parents are dedicated to the work of the church, it can be difficult, especially if the church service is long. Like, man, our church service was long. And we even went to school in our church clothes, not because we didn't have regular clothes, because we never made it home. We'd pull up to school, I'm like, Mama, I ain't got my books. She'd be like, well, the Bible is your book. You better get on in there. <laughs> so, one of the most difficult aspects of church is this thing called contextualization. I know it's a big word, ain't it? I learned it in seminary. Yeah, contextualization. So, 
any group of people or a gathering of people that's supposed to be communal or community, when it's not relatable to the person who's attending, that could be difficult for the most mature adult, let alone a kid. So you have you know, a church service that a kid really can't relate to on one hand, and then on the other hand, you add the fact that church service is a gathering of people who are redeemed or who have been saved from the eternal doom or from just being born imperfect. And God has rescued us from, from this doom and we come together to celebrate. But in the celebration and coming together, we come looking all stone faced. Look at me. That's, you add those two things, man, church can become very difficult for a person who's looking to find themselves or trying to find where they fit in. And so it's my desire as comedian Jason Earls to bring joy to people, that we can experience the joy that Jesus talked about in John 15. Well, that ain't how it is a lot of times. So let me relax, learn to laugh. This is awesome, y'all. Uh, man, I, I grew up in church. Uh, my dad is a pastor. My granddad is a pastor. My dog is a dog pastor. Uh, he'll be in the backyard saying, a rrr, rrr, a rrr, rrr, a rrr. We call him the Reverend German Shepherd. And his best friend's name Barnard. He's a saint. <laughs> so it's amazing, man, that we can come to a church and, and, and laugh because I hated going to church when I grew up. Grew up. I mean, I didn't like it, man. We were going to um, Sunday school, and they would walk in with the illegal Xerox copy of the Sunday school lesson. They'll walk and say, this morning, we gonna talk about joy. <laughs> How many of y'all got joy? I got it deep down in my heart. Like, would you notify your face, please? <laughs> we go to my granddad's church, which was scary, because his secretary talked like she had been smoking cigarettes since she was two. She would get up in church. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Bless the Lord. Like, uh-uh, I ain't gonna do that. I ain't gonna do that. And my granddad, this was before they invented children's church. All the kids got was a three-minute story in the middle of service. They would call all the little kids up front. It'll be a, a, a three-year-old standing beside a six-foot-three, 17-year-old. Um, and imagine hearing this story as a three-year-old. Good morning, little children. Do you know that God wants your heart? <laughs> Listen, I said, do you know that God wants your heart? He wants your mama's heart. He wants your daddy's heart. He wants your brother and your sister's heart. After all, he's got the whole world in his hand. <laughs> And do you know what happens? If you don't give God your heart, if you don't give God your heart, I said, if you don't give God your heart, he don't send you straight to hell. That's what happened. Like, like 
Some of y'all just pass gas in church. You're like, <laughs> you know how when you pass gas and nobody knows except for you, you're like, <laughs> I didn't like going to church, man. That's why, you know, when, when my wife and I had our kids, we made sure that teaching our kids about Jesus would be fun. We do it like this. The Lord loves you, and you must love them with all that you do. The Lord loves you. Tell me how you love them with all that you do. Well, I love the Lord when I'm riding my bike. I pray all day and not just at night. Oh, the Lord loves you. Hey, you. So the neighborhood kids saw us. And they were like, oh, we didn't know learning about Jesus can be so much fun. Can we come? We were like, yeah, Matthew 28. So the neighborhood girls came, they're like, the Lord loves you. And you must love them with all that you do. Just say, the Lord loves you. Tell me how you love them with all that you do. Like, Jesus and the booty hop don't go together, baby. <laughs> Man, my ultimate goal is to glorify God in everything that I do. In other words, God's goodness and his off the chartness, his banging is to be reflected in things I do to where he's pleased with it and to where other people can look at what I do. Like, you know what? Ha! Ah, something about that dude that they're drawn. You know, close to God. So that's in everything that I do. That's my desire. You know, from the way that I, you know, carry myself personally and to the way that I interact with my wife and my children and then helping them do the same. I love my wife, man, and I love my kids. So my job as a father and as a husband is to lead my family in a way that they in turn can glorify God. So if I'm doing that, and then doing it individually, then God's getting a bunch of glory from your boy. And that's that's my life goal, that's my dream, my purpose. So you that translates into everything I do. So stand-up comedy. It's my desire when you come when you hear comedian Jason Earls, for you to be able to say, you know what, that dude is funny. But yet at the same time, in the midst of you laugh and be encouraged to do what you do to the best of your ability so that you can glorify God. Dudes in prison, you know, or girls in prison. Most of the females in prison are in prison behind some dude. So I, I just, I want to be the guy to be that dude and try to, you know, get with all the girls in prison. <laughs> but my goal is for, for when people see me, for they, for them to be encouraged and, uh, that's it. King Solomon said laughter is like do of good like medicine. So if laughter is good medicine, then I'm a paramedic. I ain't the doctor. I'm just here to help fix you temporarily until you meet the doctor. And I know him. So man, I, I love, you know, just having a family. I learned how to be a godly father from watching my dad and husband. Because my dad would pray with my mom. And so I pray with my wife. And, uh, you know, I'm the leader of the house. I can't fall asleep praying. <laughs> We've been there like, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, it's come for you. You're so awesome. Thank you so much for Netflix. And uh, <laughs> we don't have any late fees. Thank you, Jesus. It's amazing how you use a movie to speak to us. We were gone, and the elephants were outside, and it's been so good to us. And she nudged me. I'm like, mm, mm, mm. Lord, you're so good, I can't say something sometimes. <laughs> Romans 8 says, we don't even know what to pray, but the Spirit prays for us. 
with groanings. <sighs> then she'd nudge me really hard. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Woo! It's awesome. Uh, so we were, when we first moved here, we were looking for a good church, man, and came across some churches that, you know, you ever went to a church that put too much value on their entertainment? Like we walk in the church, you know, they sold season tickets to the church service. <laughs> went into the sanctuary. The usher looked at us and said, how many? We said two. She said, that's smoking or non-smoking. <laughs> I wanted to see what it looked like, so I said, smoking, please. They took us up to the balcony just as they were firing up praise and worship. You know, they got in there, they were like, uh, this is the air I breathe. <laughs> this is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. And I I'm desperate for you. Now some of y'all can't enjoy the joke because you're trying to figure out if it's a real cigarette or not. <laughs> and it's lit too right I've been up here talking for 20 minutes and took a lit cigarette out of my pocket <laughs> you were so judgmental but you should get one of these and go to your pastor's I'll be like pastor I need to talk to you right now no, 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 no. I'm about to leave him. We need some counseling or something, bro. <laughs> or break it out during worship service when you're talking to the usher, like, hey! <laughs> Can I get another program? <laughs> Woo! Can you imagine the pastor said, today we're going to read from the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk? Where in the world is a Habakkuk? I can't know no more. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine. Some of y'all still like, is that a real cigarette or what? <laughs> Listen, all of us have a talent. God didn't give everybody everything, but he gave everybody something. And you should use that something to glorify God uh, use it to serve in your church, but uh, if you can't spell, do not put together the church's lyrics to put the songs on the screen, please. People are like, we thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for your everlasting mercury. We give you all the prices. I bow before your prostate. Prostate, do I fall? Let it be a sweet smelling aroma. That is nasty. If you cannot pronounce uh, words, biblical words like, like hypocrisy, don't try to read the Bible, please. <laughs> One dude got up and said, abstain from hypo crispy. One dude got up to read John chapter 3. Now listen to this. This is how John chapter 3 reads. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbi. 
this dude got up and said, there was a man of the frequencies who was on narcotics. Who came to Jesus by night and said, Rabbit, if you have no computer skills, uh, please do not try to operate the church's computer system for the lyrics. That'll mess you up. Like, Thank you, Lord. I worship you, Lord. I worship you. I worship you, Microsoft. 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 Microsoft, 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 the overhead is overheated, please power off, control, alt, delete, yeah, come on, sing it with me, control, Huh? All over the building, come on, sing that, sing that. Listen, 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 listen. What we do? Shut down. Okay, or cancel. And the pastor, real smooth with it, he gets up, try to play it off. That's right, God wants to control, alt, delete your life. Some of your lives are frozen. You can't click back and you click, can't click forward. And God wants to control or delete your life. Like, you're like, you right, but get Brother Ricky off that PowerPoint, please. <laughs> Man, cell phones are awesome. Uh, they're a good indicator of where you are. Like, some people don't know how to turn their ringtones off when they get into church. One dude walked in like, you know, God bless you, God bless you. I was praying for you, and his phone rung. Let me see you shake it, shake it. Whoop, there it is. Whoop. Can you turn your phone off, Pastor, please? Well, some of us been there acting like we're all focused, like, as the deer panted for the water, so my womb long if after you. Womb, you You. Oh. you are oh, I my to you alone. I'm gonna call you back. I'm gonna call you back. I saw one guy like this. He was like, I love you, Lord, and I live. Yes. Yes, I'm coming home. I'm coming home. Yes, we need bread. We need bread. I'll be there in 15 minutes. I'm like, Jesus coming back in 15 minutes? I need to get myself together. Thank you all. this what if cell phones were out 200 plus years ago history wouldn't even be the same like the red coats are coming sin all uh, you're a religious guy like, yeah yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Christian yeah I'm Christian believe in Jesus Christ yeah the head of my life Putting your hands together just for a second. Oh, dude. If you really want to take a stand, clap your hands. That is what I want you to do. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. All ye people, clap your hands. Everybody clap your hands. If you really want to take a stand, clap your hands. That is what I want you to do. Clapping your hands to the rhythm, not just the right thing to do. An ovation for the presence of the king, while the spirit is. 
But it doesn't really mean the same thing Unless you plan to clap your hands To let the present ring 